comes to America, the problem that uh, we feel indebted to America for rescuing us out of World War II, and no matter what America does, we'll always be there to say that we're, we're still loyal to you. I'd like to hear what you think about yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you should say that. I just had lunch today with a visiting American academic, and, and we were talking about these issues, and he said, or several other people there said, it's really just emotional, isn't it? And, you know, it's not logical at all. It's not rational. It's, it's emotional. And I think that's probably true, and that's what go successive governments have capitalised on. It's the sort of warm, fuzzy feeling. But when you expose that to the light of day, you see something quite different about the Alliance. And this is not to criticise the United States in any sense at all. It's just to be realistic. And American presidents, several of them, have said time and again, and other leaders have said time and again, look, we go to war in our own interests, not in anybody else's, and why would you expect them to? And anyone who believes that, in Downer's words, is a fool. And, and, so, and so time and again, you know, eminent people from the Pentagon and from the State Department have come to Australia and said, look, you guys had better shape up because your defence is your own business and you better realise that and get on with it. And I can't think of more sound advice because, as I said, the treaty obliges neither of us to do anything. And on the two occasions when Australia asked the United States to do something, they declined. And on the one occasion when I, that I can think of when the United States asked Australia to do something, we declined. So uh, whether that means that the treaty is not worth the paper it's written on is something that no politician who wants to be re-elected is going to go to the electorate with. And I don't know how many of you read yesterday's Sydney Morning Herald. They had a whole page of issues that were predicted to come up in the new parliament under headings this is this is the issue and these are the <clears throat> these are the contentious points and and so on good to have there was immigration there was defense defense was all about submarines and there was health education blah 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 foreign affairs wasn't even <coughs> there it wasn't even there and yet we have a, a, a white paper being developed on foreign affairs at the moment. We will see it next year. God knows what will be in it because the parliament won't have even thought about it. And to such an extent has this been, this whole idea of what Australia's foreign policy should be, to such an extent has this been watered down and and push to one side that you really wonder whether we deserve to be an independent country at all. Mm. Well, the fact is we're not. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, Andrew Wilkie, uh, who's now in Parliament, this very interesting Parliament that we have, and it's been said of him that he was the only active working analyst in the Western world who actually resigned on matter of principle at the time of... of I, I, I'm not sure exactly about the timing, but he's not the only one. Uh, not at all. <clears throat> there were three in the United States who did. And I was just talking to this academic today about them, and he mentioned all their names, and I can't re recall them. But there was one with a name like John Brown, something very, you know. And, and these people made public statements about why they were resigning and have never been heard of again, you know. Uh, and don't forget there was also the, the legal advisor um, to Goldsmith in the UK who said that she would not uh, put her name to the legal advice that was being given to the government and she walked out. And of course there was Claire Short, the uh, British MP and, and, and uh, the one who died, a Labour, yeah, no, a Labour politician. Um, oh, I'll, I'll think of it in a moment. Anyway, he he resigned also um, over the Iraq uh, uh, thing, and and 
You may be right, though, about Australia. I think Wilkie's the only one. I think Wilkie's the only one who's resigned. I had already resigned. Um, Brian Cunningham. Um, just a side note: I've run into Johnny Howard a couple of times, walking from um, Parliament House to the MLC Centre. Um, gave it to him all the way. War criminal, liar, liar, children overboard. <laughs> you know, but and, um, once he got held for an hour by police until they could locate him and see if he dropped charges, which he did. Didn't want to press him. And I just saw him recently, in, um, about a few months ago, and gave it to him. Just kept saying war criminal. Anyway, uh, um, are you aware um, when he actually gave, uh, how it gave his speech, his actual war speech, that it was word for word the same as Canada's Prime Minister Stephen Harper? <laughs> word for word. Um, another one was. Um, and, and, and also, it was very close to the one Blair made. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> was prog, yeah. And um, I heard something else through um, some good sources, Paul Craig Roberts, and he's, he's fabulous, and, um, that Saddam Hussein was about to um, ditch selling um, oil for US dollars, That's which right. the US, <laughs> and that was the main reason um, for the invasion, plus pipelines. It's, all, it's always about pipelines running through Syria, or Afghanistan, or Iraq. Uh, no, no. Uh, the majority of ISIS. Uh, have you heard that the majority of them are, are mercenaries? And, of, and, uh, of whom? The vast majority of, of ISIS fighters are actual mercenaries, supposedly trained by CIA and uh, Mossad. That's what I'm talking about. Can you answer any of them? <laughs> Give me something. I, I can see your. Your fertile brain's been at work, and um, quite, quite frankly, to the, all of the above, you're not wrong. We were just talking, a little group of us over here in the break, about the, I'll, I'll just pick on this particularly, about the oil thing. As, as um, Wolfowitz said, they fixed the policy, that, or, or rather, they, they decided on WMD because all the other things were too problematic. That's to say the neocon advisors to Bush. And the only thing they could all agree upon was Saddam Hussein could be accused of having weapons of mass destruction because they kept the receipts, right? And, 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 and so that was what they did. But in fact, the the underground, the underlying uh, motive for years, for decades, for American policy in the Middle East has been oil. Pipelines, currencies in which it's traded, and nationalization thereof. And anyone who tries to nationalize oil in their country is not going to have a long or successful career as long as the CIA is around. And <laughs> this is absolutely true. And the, and the wonderful thing about saying this is that the Americans are the best uh, at admitting that this is the case. And there are heaps and heaps of American documents that show this. And so as far as, you know, being the land of the free and the home of the brave and the defenders of freedom all over the world, you get an e the first and only <coughs> elected prime minister of Iran, who then nationalizes oil, and immediately <laughs> the CIA does him in, you know, and and it and on it has gone, and on it has gone, and the Brits have never been far behind. Don't forget, also while we're talking about these things, don't forget that the two largest exporters of arms, you know, the whole defense panoply in the world are the United States and great, soon to be little, Britain. <laughs> so don't forget what their other, I mean oil is one thing and that's very important, but arms and the export thereof to Saudi Arabia or whoever you like, and particularly to proxy uh, war fighters, 
like Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, for instance, is an extremely, uh, it's something that is extremely good for business. When you can't sell much else, you can sell more. And they're doing it, and they're doing it and doing it, and not only that, we are complicit in it too. And I'm sure, you know, from your gestures that you agree. And you only have to go into Canberra and, and all the way in from the airport, there's Raytheon, there's, there's all these um, uh, Boeing, et cetera, et cetera, all these, these um, advertisements for companies involved in the military and industrial complex, as Eisenhower called it. And we are just so embedded in it and so involved in it that the kinds of things I've been saying tonight really don't have a chance of standing up because I can't see myself, I, I really can't see how any Australian government is going to extricate ourselves from it. You know, we've got Australian uniformed uh, senior military serving side by side in American units all over the place, particularly in the Pacific. And if there was a war, say, that the Americans wanted, for whatever reason, to do with China, they would be in there and we would either have to extract them or go along with it. And what do you think we would do? Give you a guess. Huh? <coughs> and, and all the little pr precious legalisms that, like I talk about the treaty and it doesn't justify this, you know, oh, law, what's that? Out the window. It doesn't matter. I mean, the number of articles I read and people I hear talking, as, as if international law is nothing. It, it doesn't exist. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, I was talking with Tom Switzer yesterday, and he said, well, the fact that the people voted for it justifies it, doesn't it? I said, it's illegal. He said, what do you mean? They made it legal by voting for it. Whew. This is a new idea of legality, in my view. And, and the questions you've raised are absolutely appropriate. Um, it's 50 years since the Pine Gap uh, base was established in Australia, and that's really a linchpin of the Australia-US alliance in practice. And in fact, I just want to give a plug because there's a convergence in Alice Springs. Uh, maybe, you, maybe you're going, I don't know. My sister knows. Uh, my September sister knows going. The 3rd of October <laughs> in Alice Springs. And I just want to give a plug. If anyone wants to find more information, come and see me afterwards. But this is a critical. Uh, you know, base of the Australia-US alliance. Um, my uh, question is relating to the fact that, you know, why why couldn't we stop the Iraq war when, uh, and what is the difference between, say, the Iraq war and the Vietnam war in relation to Australia? I think, you know, in many ways, the, the powers that be learned from the Vietnam War, they learn from the Vietnam Syndrome, and in the end, it comes down in, in a lot of respects to body bags. That, you know, we had 500 Australians killed in Vietnam, and a lot fewer were casualties of the Iraq War and the Afghan War. So, I think that you know we we have got to we've got a lot of work to do to try to explain to the people out there that um, you know we shouldn't get involved in these wars. And I'm very interested in your brochure about what you're calling for. I just want to my question relates to something that's just come up on the side at the moment. We're having a huge controversy at the moment in Australia about a plebiscite for equal marriage rights. Now, no one has pointed out, we're having a vote of the Australian people at the cost of... Seven money. million dollars. How much? Seven and a half million. Large amount of money on really a question that relates to just people making a choice. But we don't even have a vote of the parliament, as you point out, on war. Why not? campaign for a plebiscite. If we're going to go to war, why shouldn't we have a plebiscite of the Australian people? That's my question. Um, there, there was a terrific piece in yesterday's Herald, which I um, neglected to cut. And I sort of scanned it quickly 
but I now realise that I should have read it in more depth because this man, Alan, I've forgotten his other name, um, was, was putting up 10 points which we could build into this expensive plebiscite and get some real answers on a few things. And the top one was, why don't we get war powers reform? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, or, or, or rather, have an in inquiry into the Iraq War, one or the other, I can't remember which it was. But, but this is the point. I mean, for goodness sake, as, I, as, as you say, um, we inquire into everything that moves, and yet the most important question that any government can face, which is, do you go to war or not, is made on the whim of one man, virtually alone. And this is absolutely primitive and it it betrays Australia as still um, a colonial country because this is how it was when Australia was founded and we went to Britain's wars whenever they asked us and it was the same when we changed over to doing that with the United States in 1942 however here is the thing to bear in mind. Since 1945, and, and just to sort of keep this up your sleeve when you're sort of talking to Neanderthals, since, since 1945, we have been to numerous wars at the behest of the United States. And we haven't won one. Not one. We won in 1945, and here we are in 2016 without a single victory. We had a draw in Korea. We had a defeat in Vietnam. We had another defeat in Afghanistan. We have another one in Iraq. We're going to have another one in Syria. Baron Cod is about to fall. Uh, exactly. And and you'd have to say, if this was a business, the shareholders would be saying, is this value for money? Or get rid of the CEO, or cut off his bonus, or something else. And, and, and at the very least, given what we now know about how to properly manage companies and all of this sort of thing, and we've all learnt, you know, cost-benefit analysis and, and, and opportunities and threats and all this stuff. And we don't do it about war. It's absolutely irrational. And the sooner we get that, even if we're just talking in emotional terms, as we just agreed is sometimes the case, even if we just talk in emotional terms, it's got to be an outrage, <laughs> let alone if, as is the case for one of our members, her husband died in Afghanistan. And that's why, although she's got acute depression and two small children, she keeps campaigning and every time she goes and campaigns, she has another attack of acute depression. You know, the spillover of this stuff. And we're only, you're talking about small numbers of casualties. What about the casualties for which we're responsible? Come back to Pine Gap. One of the reasons that it's so important for anyone who can go to that is because Pine Gap has not lost its function. We still haven't gained control of it. It still does what the Americans want it to do, just as it did in the 70s. But what we're now doing is coordinating drone strikes out of there. That is, we're killing people over there from something that's organized here. So we are as responsible for those unknown people's deaths. This is extrajudicial killing, the kind of thing that Mr. Duterte does in the Philippines. And we are responsible. And, and we keep looking the other way as if we have no responsibility at all. We do. Now, when in the Iraq war, we, I was on the committee that mobilised all the um, all the great rallies. We actually had bigger we had the biggest rallies ever against war over the Iraq War. Five hundred thousand people marched through Sydney. I know. Okay? I was there. So I would say that's for our generation, that or slightly younger. That goes on. People never lose that that awareness. 
Now I think about their children, I'm thinking about kids who are in their 20s or even early 30s. They don't have, I don't think, the same uh, mythic attitude about the United States that because they saved us in the last war, that, that's irrelevant to me. There's been a generational change. I'm not saying they're pro-peace, but I don't think that that particular sort of card can be played for the younger generation starting 20 or 30. And if there was any move towards war, there would be another enormous opposition, perhaps calling for a plebiscite. I think that's a very good idea. So I just wonder about your comments about that. And my second question is very brief. When are you going to write your book about giving all this extraordinary material you've given us so that the rest of Australia can, can read it? Because it's so fantastic. You know, ever since Shakespeare, we've com been complaining about what's the matter with kids today. <coughs> And I'm, I'm not as pessimistic. No, I'm optimistic. They, they, okay, they, they may do things in different ways, but the kids who I encounter, particularly through my, my granddaughter, um, are very switched on, highly intelligent, very well informed, and uh, pretty idealistic as well, as well as... Um, mistrustful of the uh, things that they see going on around them. What worries me more, and this is what I've been writing about lately, is, in fact, Don Watson has, has alluded to it in his new quarterly essay, is, is a tendency in Australia that I find really alarming um, towards fascism. And, and this, unfortunately, if, if I'm right, can sweep the young in as much as anybody else because of fear. And what the young, to generalize hugely, uh, are fearful of nowadays is not being able to get a job, not being able to get a house, not being able to find a partner and raise a family, or whatever it is that they most want to do with their lives because of, of terrible uncertainty about where their income is going to come from. And this is exactly what the 1% wants. The 1% wants the 90% to be scared. And that's exactly what's happening. And it's not only the young who are scared, although they have more right to be scared than the rest of us, but they're also seeing the destruction of our environment. They don't know how to stop that happening. They don't know how to control the forces that are pushing them towards being fearful, even aggressive, even full of hate and, and vengeance, the kind of thing I was just describing. And I really worry about the sort of social compact that we used to have in Australia. We didn't even know it was good when we had it. But with hindsight, it doesn't look good. And, you know, there's, a, there's an American um, minister of religion who wrote 14 points of fascism, 14 characteristics of fascism. And Australia qualifies for every single one of them at the moment. It, it really is worrying if you have a look at them. Lawrence, what's his other name? Um, I can send it to you. And, and it involves militarism, uh, acceptance of aggression, racism, uh, uh, xenophobia, and, and a violent response to these things, which empowers people who don't have anything else much going for them. And we're seeing this with Pauline Hansen, you see? It's the same stuff. They tap into it, and you can well understand <clears throat> why they do. But people like her and Trump and others use it to their advantage, just as Franco did, just as Hitler did, just as Mussolini did. And it sounds extraordinary to compare anyone in Australia to those sorts of figures. But the more you look at Australian history, the more fascinating this undercurrent of fascism is. And what I've done in something I'm writing, well, it won't be the book that you're talking about, but we'll see about that. Um, it'll be in it. Um, 
what I've done is I've picked off various periods in Australia's modern history, interwar periods, when we weren't at war. And what happens in interwar periods is out comes this sort of military underground, secret movements like the New Guard, remember? The New Guard was the one in the Depression. Then there was more of it in the 1950s. Then there's been more of it recently with all of these mini parties uh, called Rise Up and Unite Australia and all of these things, the Q Society, etc. And it's all based on xenophobia, racism, aggression, and, and the hope that somehow ordinary people can be empowered by this stuff. The latest lot, at least, is not anti-Semitic, but the earlier stuff was. And, and to do this work, I went back and read what I hadn't read for years since I was a student, is D.H. Lawrence's Kangaroo. It's all in there, it's all in there. The new guard, he anticipated it by 10 years. Extraordinary stuff. And this was Australia. And it is so at odds with the conventional um, self-image that we are inculcated to believe that we have about being egalitarian, fair, and honest, and generous, and law-abiding, and all of these nice things, like hell. Have a look at this stuff. Um, hi, Alison. Thank you for your presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, I just want to address this to me as a myth that Australia was saved from a Japanese invasion by the US during World War II. As a humble high school history, history teacher, the sources that I have read say that um, Roosevelt and Churchill had a secret agreement not to come to Australia's aid in the event of a Japanese invasion because they wanted to win the war in Europe first. Also, I've read a lengthy interview with General Tojo on the eve of his execution, where he said that it was uh, that Japan, Japan, Japan didn't have the military capability to invade Australia because all their forces were tied down in the Pacific theatre, which they ultimately lost. That war in the Pacific, they lost. So, um, and he said, uh, and of course, the push south to Port Moresby was aimed at securing uh, Dutch East Indies oil, which they ultimately did. Do you have any information that uh, supports the assertion that, Austra that uh, many Australians believe that we have to come to America's aid in the event of uh, any war that they happen to, you know, uh, not blunder into, but, uh, but no, not blunder, it's not a blunder, it's an exercise in imperial, they're all exercises in imperial aggression. Do you have any information that, uh, that um, supports the idea that Australia was actually saved from a, uh, a Japanese invasion in World War II. I agree with you about what Japan's intentions and capacities were. As you know, they had a, north, a, a strike north and a strike south contention between the army and the navy before the war. And they were debating about that for years and years and years. And they eventually decided to strike south, even though the Navy knew that their capacity would not reach further than, say, Papua New Guinea. And that was why they did the, um, the, the Pearl Harbor exercise, because they staked everything. It, you could understand the logic. They staked everything on a major effort to take out the American capacity to control the Pacific. And if that had worked, then you know the rest might have been history, but it didn't work, and there are conspiracy theories about why it didn't. Because the Americans knew it was going to happen because we'd cracked the code, and they made sure that half the fleet was out. And but they also, um, some some say, encouraged the attack on Pearl Harbor because then that brought America into the war. With what? as you correctly say, has become the mythology ever since that the United States saved us. Um, it's hard with these events to say, you know, hypothetically, what might have happened if this hadn't happened or that hadn't happened. What I would say about Australia's involvement in the war is that we need not 
have got ourselves so exposed to it. If we had not hyped ourselves up for half a century to believe that Japan was the enemy. Japan was our ally in World War I, pretty reluctant, uh, on, reluctantly on the part of some Australians who had big suspicions about Japanese intentions. If they were powerful and they were Asian, they must want to take us over. It was the kind of sophistication of the thinking at the time. But the fact was, if we had known more, and in fact some Australians did know and said it, but they were ignored, uh, if we had known that all the United, uh, all Japan wanted was to control the oil from Papua New Guinea and Indonesia, and at the very most to knock out the American storages on the northern fringes of Australia, then there would have been much less uh, panic in Australia and much less uh, need, perceived need, on the part of, of Curtin to go along as he did with the United States. But the trouble was, put yourself in his position. He, he had to be responsible for the defense of the country. He didn't know enough about Japanese intentions. Probably the information he was getting was contradictory. Um, and he had to take the prudential course. I mean, I can understand why he did that. The only thing that we now get wrong because we mythologize the alliance all the time, is that we owe America everything because they saved us. You see? And, and that's your point. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an understandable one, but it's not going to go anywhere. The main thing is to look at what the United States itself says, which is that they will not, as I said earlier, defend when they will not go to war anywhere where it's not in their interests and they will not risk another land war in the Asian region. So if any of us thinks that it's a good idea to have a fight with China, forget it. Get it. It's not going to happen and we should be making sure that we stay on good terms with the Chinese and the Americans too and show them that that it is possible to get on with each other without resorting to war every time somebody has a problem. Here is the thing. In the State Department, you have huge numbers of highly intelligent, highly trained Japanese and Chinese specialists who can tell you the inside workings of every faction, of every political party, and they know them all and have had them all to dinner. Like, you know, expertise like you would not believe. On the other hand, you have the Pentagon, who know exactly how to kill all of them and how to have a, 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 a war of immense sophistication of all sorts, targeting all kinds of different things. How do you reconcile these two modes of thought? It's almost like a country at war with itself, and we replicate that in Canberra, exactly. We have people who do exactly those things in exactly the same way. And there's no way that you can get them together to say, well, hang on, as Hugh White has tried to do, surely there's a more sensible way of handling this that suits Australia's interests because this is our part of the world. China is our biggest trading partner. What in the world do we want to fight them for? And anyway, the South China Sea is the route that we all need to trade in. The Ch Ch Chinese can't get their milk powder unless the South China Sea is open to Australia. Huh? Are they going to close that down? Of course not. I mean, along with all the other characteristics of fascism, militarism is the stupidest. Can we thank Alison now, please. I think she's been up.